Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be back in Edinburgh. We're just we're all saying how, how lovely it is to come up to Edinburgh and uh, enjoy the city up here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, uh, this evening briefly about um, LEDs, but the, the theme, if you like, is a little bit... Um, you know, I said, well, what do you want me to say? And he said, well, we've got all these questions that people ask about LEDs. So I'll try to base my, my talk, if you like, about some of the questions that people have, have asked and what people think about uh, LEDs. But I want to start by just, um, again, it's, you know, what people think. Uh, you know, in a, in a survey when people were asked about the environment, what is it that they have concerns about, there's a whole lot of things that came out. But uh, the top two were the depletion of natural resources and, and greenhouse gases. So, you know, it's interesting to, to know that despite the fact that sometimes we might think we've taken our eye off the carbon agenda, uh, it is still there in people's, people's mind. 92% um, were concerned about the, the, the state of the planet and what we're going to leave our, our children. Now, I've got children and uh, shortly I shall uh, become a grandfather. And you start to think, actually, when I work it out, um, that child, when it's born, is probably going to be here right towards the end of the century. And you do think, well, what sort of planet are we, you know, is our generation leaving for, uh, for the next generation? 40% uh, believe that um, one of the main barriers to, uh, to energy saving and, and uh, reducing carbon is the upfront cost. So I don't think that's, that's probably a surprise. But these are the challenges that we, we need to overcome. And we see many big uh, international corporate brands actually looking for their corporate responsibility and positioning themselves in terms of either the technology, the solutions, long-term vision, um, and where they see themselves uh, in terms of the whole climate change agenda. And it's quite interesting to see where you know, some of the different organisations exist. Not unsurprisingly, people like Body Shop right over there in the, uh, the top right-hand corner. So there's definitely a, a corporate move to, to support the whole sustainable uh, agenda. And again, looking at some, some surveys, um, if you take businessmen, um, and these were facility managers in, in Germany, uh, most of them are convinced that we, we need to do something to save energy for a more sustainable solution. Um, at the same time, they still believe that one of the barriers is, is cost saving. So it's that same message coming back again. Um, you can see, you know, the environment is close to my heart, but I'm a businessman at the end of the day. It's a bit of a, 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 a dilemma. Um, and they also felt very much that there was the need to be better informed about what people can do to, to help um, work against the, uh, you know, mitigate climate, climate change. So hopefully that's what we're going to do here this evening. Uh, you know, a few other interesting facts. Um, I'm sure we're all aware that um, uh, in the UK, I know you've got lots of lovely hydro up here in Scotland, so that's, that's, that's really good. But um, by 2016, as we start to shut down some of our old coal-fired power stations, the uh, resilience of our energy supply, so that's the difference between what we use and what we've got, drops to about 2%. So it may even be, it's not just a case of saving energy because you want to save money or reduce CO2, it might be that we've actually got to start switching things off or someone's going to turn the big switch and then we'll, you know, we'll all be plunged into, into darkness. And you know, 2016 isn't that far away. It's certainly not my grandchild's generation. It's, it's going to happen to us now. And this is very much a, a, a global issue, of course. And it's quite interesting if you look at uh, how different areas, regions within the world are using uh, energy uh, and electricity. This big band in the middle here, the, gre the green band that is just going on and expanding and expanding, is what's happening in the, in the Asian economy. You can see everyone else is pretty much stable in terms of their energy generation. So yeah, it's very easy to say, well, actually, then it's not our problem. Um, but it, it is really, it's, a, it's a, a global problem that we have to address. So, with all of that background, what can lighting do? Um, well, I think we were doing reasonably well. We've, we've always been um, quite good at coming up with innovative ideas that'll help to reduce energy and, and reduce carbon. Uh, and I think that I can remember it must have been 
oh, 2003, I came up, in fact, to Glasgow, and we saw the very first um, exterior installation using LED lighting on the, the, the bridge in, in Glasgow. And he thought, wow, you know, that's, that's interesting, but maybe it's just a, you know, a sort of you know, outdoor lighting decorative, perhaps that's where it's gonna, gonna stay. Um, and then by the time we got to, uh, to 2011, we began to see the LED really start to take over. Um, we had nice white LEDs that could start to replace some of our traditional light sources. Uh, and at that time, uh, something like 18%, so the, these are actually um, Philips figures, so 18% of our, our sales was in LED products. By 2015, we predict that half of everything we sell globally in lighting is going to be LED. And by the time we get to the end of the decade, that's going to raise to, to 75%. Now, as Malcolm said, I've been in the industry since 1977, and I have never seen anything that's, moving, that's moved as fast as this and is providing change um, that we all have to try to get, get used to. Uh, so it's a very exciting time, but at the same time, we have to start to almost go and re-educate ourselves in many aspects of, uh, of lighting. So one of the questions is, how do you justify the cost? You know, these LED things are more expensive than the conventional lamp. Well, you have to understand that our conventional light sources are made in a very traditional way, glass melted and bits of wire put together in machines, and um, the, uh, the, the, the unit cost of the light source is relatively, relatively low. When we talk about LEDs, we're talking about silicon technology. So we have to, first of all, start by making the silicon wafer itself. And to give you some sort of idea, um, when we make a wafer that's about the size of a, I was going to say a, a 45. There's some of you who won't know what I'm talking about. But you know, a, a record about this sort of size. Um, you get something like 5,000 chips. 5,000 wafers on, the, on a piece of silicon that size. And to make it, we have to put it in a very expensive oven that costs many, many millions of, of pounds. And the, the temperature at which we operate it to get all the layers on is a sort of 1,000 degrees centigrade. Um, and I was talking to some of the people who operate this, this type of machinery, and they go, yeah, you know, and if you're half a degree out, you can throw that whole silicon wafer away. So it's an incredibly tightly controlled process. So getting the silicon wafer itself is quite expensive. And then once you've got the wafer, you have to put it in a package so that somebody can then mount it on a, a printed circuit board. We might then build that into a module. Uh, and finally, we build that into a luminaire. And one of the things we have to be very careful of is we have to control the heat. So very often, the luminaire has got extra metal built into it to make sure we can keep the heat um, away from the, the, the chip itself, that bit of silicon, and keep it operating as efficiently as possible. So if you look at that whole process compared to traditional lighting, um, it's not surprising that, that the products end up costing a little bit more than uh, our conventional solutions. But here's some good news, um, because uh, LEDs are going to follow the same trend as every other electronic component, and that is, over time, they're going to improve in performance, and they're going to reduce in price. So that's a, a graph that is showing what is happening. So the, uh, the blue line is the, 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 the cost per lumen, and the yellow line is the amount of light that we're getting out of it. And you can see the little dots that, um, that have generated those lines. So there's very much a trend. So um, LEDs are going to follow the train, same trend as all other uh, light sources. Now, this bit of information, I have to say, I only picked up on the train on the way up here. And it's from a, a report that's come out from the European Union. It's a reference down there. Um, it's all to do with their eco-design um, consultation. And this was a, um, they, they published some information from McKinsey's, uh, who said that they estimate that the, the forecast is that prices are going to fall at 16% per year. So, OK, it's good news for everybody, hopefully, because people will be able to adopt the technology um, you know, as it becomes more readily, more readily available. So, like all new technologies, you know, we expect to see the price gradually drop down. So the other question, another question is, 
What about lifetime claims? Well, to be honest, you know, we could spend the rest of the evening talking about lifetime of, of LEDs. It, it is quite a, a complicated uh, topic, so I don't want to get into too much detail. Um, I do spend quite a bit of my time working in some of the, the standardization committees, the IEC committees, um, and we're, we're desperately trying to make this whole topic easier and clearer for people because there has been a lot of confusion, and I think that confusion has led to people saying, I'm not certain I quite either understand or believe what you're, what you're telling me. So the first thing is that, uh, of course, if you've got a product that's going to last a very long time, how do you know how long it's going to last without running it for that length of time? So if we've got a, a, an LED lamp or luminaire and we say, well, this could last you 40,000 hours, 60,000 hours, that's something like eight, 10 years in, in operation. By the time we find out how long it's going to last, the technology has completely changed. So the information is, is useless to us. It doesn't mean anything. So what we do is again, we copy exactly what everyone else has been doing in the, the chip industry. So we take our, our lead from um, all, the other LED, um, all the other silicon components and we do initial life testing and then we, we predict. So for our LED products, we actually measure them usually for 6,000 hours. So that's about nine months operation in a, in a year. And then we use well-proven statistics that haven't come from lighting, but they've come, say, from the, 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 the chip industry. So we can then predict what's going to happen beyond that initial measurement period. So therefore, we can say with a fair amount of confidence that the products we make today, and we've measured, we can predict what's going to happen to them in the, in the future. So it's important to understand that uh, there is actually quite a lot of um, science and engineering um, and mathematics behind these lifetime claims. That, um, that, that people make. The other thing that you need to understand is the actual thing that you're being told about the lifetime. Because uh, inside the, uh, has this got a little dot on it? It's, yes. So inside the package here, so this is the, the silicon wafer, all right? Now, when LEDs were first being talked about, when people talked about life, that was what they were talking about, that little device there. Um, and uh, the amount of light you get out is, is measured at a flash. So it's not really getting hot. It's not being used in a practical application. So people are going, well, that thing there is going to last 100,000 hours, 200,000 hours. And everyone went, wow, that's great. We're going to have you know, all these products in our homes and all the rest of it. And you know, I've got some LEDs in my LED lamps in my home. I'm going to have to put them in my will, even for my children, they're going to last so long. Um, but that is totally different to to this, what is the life of the luminaire, which actually is what, what you're interested in. Um, because when you put that into a, a luminaire, you run it constantly, it gets hotter. Of course, it's not going to give you the same performance. So when people are quoting life to you, you have to make sure that they are telling you that that is the life of the product that you're buying, not a subcomponent of that, of that product. Hopefully, that message is, um, is now getting across most reputable manufacturers will quote you the correct, the correct life. But occasionally you do see these headline numbers um, and you really have to, have to make sure you understand what they are. Um, this is another comment. There's no specification for lead products, which me leaves the market absolutely wide open. Well, that's not, not quite true. Um, within the, the lighting profession, we got together in 2009, I see one of the fellow contributors sitting on the front row here, um, uh, with all the different lighting organisations, the trade associations, the professional associations for designers, um, and we said there's a lot of confusion out there. Let's try to produce a document that helps to explain what this is all about and essentially produce guidelines for people to specify their product. Um, and if you use the guidelines, then hopefully you'll, you'll get what you, what you think you're going to get. Um, behind all of that is an awful lot of work that's going on within the IEC on standardization. Um, we don't actually have stick men. We have, we have real people that do this work. And these are international experts that sit down and they prepare standards on both product safety and product performance. And that is underpinning all the work that, that we're doing. The challenge, of course, is that uh, you're trying to write standards um, that everybody agrees internationally 
And uh, you can imagine what it's like when you've got you know, people from China and Korea and Europe and the States uh, and Australia all sitting in a room trying to get them to agree on something. But that's, that's what we do. Um, I think it's very valuable work because you end up with a global standard um, on uh, the specification and performance for LED products. So there is a lot of standardization that already exists. Um, and as long as you are convinced that the people who are selling you the products are, are following these standards and guidelines for the data that they're, they're giving you, then you can have some confidence about the performance of the, the products themselves. Um, people are nervous about LEDs, as there are so many NAF products on the market. It wasn't my words, but you know, we sort of understand what you mean. So again, I go back to this, this document, uh, and if you look in there, there's a, there's a simple checklist, there's sort of 11 items, if you like, and you, you just simply say to the manufacturer, what's your power, what's your flux, what's your efficacy? Just go down that, that list of things. And if they can provide all of that information, then probably it's not going to be a NAF product. Um, if they you know, can only tell you a couple of the things, um, and they're trying to fob you on, off on the rest of it, you sort of say, well, actually, please go away and, um, you know, and come, come back again, perhaps, when you've got some, some real data to, to back up your, your claims. Another common question, with short life cycles, how do we know what to use in 18 months' time? And this is a real, this is a real challenge, um, because, as I said, the technology is moving very quickly at the moment. Uh, and I think the only thing I can suggest is that whereas perhaps if you're planning a long project, you might in the past have said, right, that's the product we're going to use, it goes into the specification, and it goes right the way through, and two or three years later it's delivered and put on site. We have to find a way of designing the lighting, putting a specification together, but leaving the absolute product that's going to be delivered for that till a bit later in the, uh, uh, the life cycle of the, uh, uh, the program. So that, if you like, you know where the hole's going to go in the ceiling, you know it's got to have an electrical supply to it and it's going to be connected to a control system. But maybe the actual product itself, although you've got an idea what it's going to be, at the point at which almost where the contractor's saying, well, I need to install these, you need to then be, be thinking, well, what is the most efficient product? And it's exactly like buying a, buying a laptop. You know, when do you go and buy a laptop? Because you know if you leave it another month or two months, you'll be able to get more bucks for your, uh, for your you know, more, more bits for your pound or whatever the, uh, the expression is. Um, so that, that is, that is a, a, a challenge. Um, and people say, well, the products are you know, changing so quickly that maybe I'll wait a little bit longer. Well, I think that um, the answer to that is, is to look at the, the economics. Because I think you know, we'd be the first to accept that at the moment, the rate things are going, although you talk about products that could last you 10, 15, maybe even longer in terms of their, their time scale, uh, we know that you know, in maybe five or six years' time, the technology will have improved, and certainly within the rest of this, de this decade, the technology will have improved to the point that you can probably afford to, to do some sort of replacement. So the first thing you need to think about when you look at the product is, does it have the facility to be upgraded? Um, you know, again, initially, everyone was going, ah, oh, sealed for life, don't have to touch it. And you go, actually, if we make it with some replaceable components, then perhaps in five or six years' time, we can come along, take that circuit board out, and put another circuit board back in again. Um, it'll have fewer LEDs, they're running at a, a lower power, uh, whatever, whatever that might be. And you might find that the cost of doing that is still economic in, in, in six years' time. And this was just a, an example of a calculation that we did, where if you actually look at the potential, this was um, uh, comparing it against uh, a SON, a high-pressure sodium solution, so it's like a street lighting application. And we said, well, if you don't upgrade it, what happens? And then if you upgrade it, say, in six years' time, what happens? So obviously, what you're doing is you're, you're reducing overall your energy. So if you look at the final block of bar graphs, you can see that even you know, if you if you upgrade and you, you spend the money on upgrading, the total costs are still lower by doing that than by leaving the original product that you had. Uh, so these are again, you know, perhaps new ideas that we have to 
grapple with as we're in the, the time at the moment when the technology is moving quite, quite fast. Uh, probably when we get to 2020, the, the, the speed of uh, innovation is going to slow down a little bit and it'll be a different story. But if you say what's happening now, then I think that that, that could be um, a solution. Again, this, this was a, a, a quote that I took out of that same EU document as I was, I was coming up here on the train. Um, the choice of an LED rather than a compact fluorescent, uh, they estimate currently pays for itself in five years. So it gives you a feel as to what they think the, the, the payback is uh, based on the, the higher initial capital cost. But they expect that to reduce to 1.7 years by 2016, so only another couple or so years away. And by the end of the decade, um, it'll be half a year. So you can see that um, you know, we are very much moving in that direction of the, uh, the cost-benefit equation becoming more and more uh, positive. And again, another interesting graph that I thought uh, you might like to see. And this is a prediction of the market share of all the different light sources going up to 2025. So you can see that the, the incandescent lamp, which is this bottom block here, well, that's all pretty much um, gone apart from uh, special lamps that we'll, we'll keep on going. Um, we had a long discussion with the, the theatre industry who were frightened that all of their, their beautiful tungsten lamps are going to disappear. Um, and they were reassured that, in fact, for their application for that type of lamp, uh, they don't come within any of these um, directives that are around to... Uh, eliminate the, the tungsten technology. Um, same with, with halogen coming in down here, so that just, just tails off a little bit. A um, little bit of discharge, but you can see in principle what's going to happen by the time we get to, to 2025, LED is going to become the dominant light source. There'll be some other players down here for particular specialist applications, um, but that's the EU's prediction of what's going to happen to the, to the market. Um, and as I said, you know, in not just my lifetime, but if you look back at the history of, of electric lighting, uh, we've never seen a transformation like this take place over such a short, a short period of time. So I think it's actually very, a very exciting time to be involved in, in lighting. So um, another question, I have doubts over the proven performance of LEDs over a, a long period of time. Well, I think what you have to do is to perhaps take confidence of some other people that have taken that, that leap of faith and have really uh, wholeheartedly embraced LED technology. So, um, you know, on a, on a, a very dramatic scale, if you uh, go to, the, uh, uh, to New York and you look to the Empire State Building, they have relit, so it's a very high-profile installation. Uh, they've relit the top of the building in colour-changing LEDs. Um, not the sort of place that you want to uh, put a technology that you think might, uh, might fail or you haven't got any confidence in. Uh, and indeed, if you've got a, a few dollars, you can go and sponsor the lighting for an evening. So if you have a favourite colour or if you're a wedding anniversary, um, you can uh, pay some money and they'll change the top of the Empire State Building to whatever colour or colour sequence that, uh, that you want. I get the impression, I did, I did check on the website, um, and you, know, you can't be too frivolous about it. You know, it's, it's my dog's birthday, I think, is not the sort of thing that they quite want to, want to do, but um, you know, there is that, that, uh, that opportunity. And compared to the lighting that they had there before, they've, they've cut their energy, um, which is you know, where the whole story started. What LEDs are really offering is this enormous potential to, uh, to reduce energy. Um, Going back to our homes here, again, that prediction, if you take um, the 2025 time uh, when we anticipate that uh, most homes will almost exclusively have LED lighting, we'll have reduced the energy load of lighting in our homes by something like 90% compared to where we were when we had, when we, when we had tungsten lamps a few, a few years ago. So that's what this is really all about. It's um, not only... LEDs offering us lots of exciting new potential for doing things, but they're going to deliver some of the energy savings that we, we so desperately need. Um, and I have to say, you know, when you, when you talk to other people in other 
energy using sectors, they look at lighting with a little bit of jealousy because they go, you guys have got it. You know, you've really got some technology and some solutions there that are going to be able to uh, deliver energy savings. You know, the, the, the Kyoto 2050 target for energy reduction in the UK is 80%. So what we're saying is, take one sector, take the home, we'll have more than delivered that before your, before your deadline. So, uh, yeah. Um, so here's another one with um, LED lighting and lighting controls. In an office situation, we've delivered energy savings of, of 45%. And I can remember only a few years ago, people saying, so when are LEDs going to take over from fluorescent lamps in office applications? Well, it, it's here now, um, you know, if you look at the, the technology. Um, you can quite easily um, outperform fluorescent lighting uh, in, uh, in office installations. And this is another case study. This is the, uh, the Royal Mail. Um, I don't know if it was these energy savings that caused the share price to go up so dramatically when it was sold. Um, but they not only made, you know, of course, made their energy savings, but you come back, every bit of energy that you save is saving carbon. So it takes us back to the, uh, to the carbon agenda uh, and really being able to help deliver on, uh, on reducing carbon. So what about the, the future? What are, the, what are LEDs doing to uh, enable us to perhaps do uh, new things in, in new ways? Uh, <clears throat> well, we know that in, in offices, sound creates a certain disturbance. And if you go next door, you'll see uh, a concept which is for an LED panel that gives good quality light and provides an illuminated ceiling, but in a form that also helps to reduce sound and noise in an office. So actually, you're providing light but you're also helping to improve the, the working environment for people in their offices. And I think for anyone who's you know, a little bit creative, it gives you a complete tool to play with. You can see the way the light pattern, the ceiling, you know, it doesn't have to be a regular square away. You can start to do some interesting things with these panels and panels of light. So go next door and have a look at that one. That's quite an interesting new concept where you're combining two things that perhaps have previously been considered separate, light and, and sound control. Uh, and, and bringing them together in a, uh, a new product. And then we have OLED, which is the organic LED. And that's probably running about five years behind LEDs at the moment. So there's some interesting concept ideas that are now using um, OLEDs. Uh, it's not going to take over from LEDs. It's a completely different solution. Um, but if you want even diffuse light, then... OLED is going to be another tool for us in the, in the future. Uh, in terms of where we are, um, back in 2010, say very much a concept uh, idea, you know, what can, what can we do with this? Um, and then we got into small luminance, so in other words, it's something that's bright, you can see it shining. Then we're beginning to get into the area of, well, actually, it can provide a bit of light on our desk, a bit of task lighting. Um, and so we see that probably... We see another breakthrough coming um, mid-next year that's going to take OLED one step further to becoming a, a, a practical light source. Uh, but uh, to give you some idea of some of those concepts that, um, that OLED is being used for, uh, this is where you go and buy your Aston Martin. Now, you can imagine that when you buy an Aston Martin, you don't just rock up at the garage and they go, here's the key, sir, it's in the car park at the back. Um, what you do is you go into a room and you are presented with your car. So in this image here, you are the, the new owner of that car and you see the way that the OLEDs are being used to create a pattern in the, in the car to really show off its shape. Um, and uh, I can only imagine looking at this in the picture because I shall never, I'm sure, um, be owning an Aston, an Aston Martin. This is a, um, an interesting uh, uh, concept where it's a, uh, an LED wall and as you put your hand on it so the LEDs go on and off so you can create patterns, you can interact with it um, and uh, Jason Bruges who's a light artist is doing a, a lot of these sorts of things with uh, um, OLEDs uh, where people can interact with them and create interesting patterns um, the Hue lamp that's already been mentioned so that's a very interesting technology um, bringing uh, the ability to change colour into our homes um, 
I mean, the great thing, I think, you know, the thing that I'd, I'd always like to try and do in, in my home is to have the latest technology, but oh, I've got to have the floorboards up, I've got to rewire, I've got to do this and that. Um, now we've got a LED technology combined with a controls technology that is just so easy. You plug the lamps in, you get your uh, iPhone, and uh, you can control the lighting from your iPhone. So suddenly, you've got the ability to really create different lighting effects in your home without major, um, major disruption. You know, any of us can, uh, can do it. And if you happen to be overseas at the time and you think, oh, I forgot to turn the kitchen light on, you just get your iPhone out and go, that's the kitchen light back on again. Oh, well, I'll have it this color tonight. So uh, very interesting. And because LEDs are basically low power devices, the next thinking is that uh, you know, all the ethernet cables and things that we have all over the place actually can maybe start to deliver power to LED products. So it's this thing called power over ethernet. Um, so you know, watch out for that one because that's going to be coming around the corner fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, in terms of cities, well, we've, we've heard the, uh, the term smart grids. So again, this is bringing control uh, to help us to limit the amount of energy. And again, why can we do this with LEDs when we couldn't do it before? Well, they're instant. You can turn them on and off. You can dim them. With conventional discharge lamps, you can turn them on and you can turn them off. If you want to turn them back on again, you sort of have to wait for them to, to cool down. And if you want to dim them, it's, it's a little bit clunky. And you certainly can't dim them right the way down. Now, I've been in an LED street lighting installation where as you walk down the road, the light comes on and then goes off behind you. And you think, this sounds like a crazy idea, but actually it works. You look down the street, they're only operating at something like 10%, but you feel perfectly safe, you can see where you're going, and when you start to get close to the, you know, as you walk along, so they, they just gradually fade up and fade down again. So, you know, if I'd have been explaining to this, this to someone 10 years ago, they're talking science fiction, but this is now science fact. Um, and with the ability for LEDs to be controlled, again, we're going to really start to eat into uh, some of those energy, uh, energy targets. So what's the future? Well, maybe we'll have um, you know, towns and cities where people can completely interact with the, with the lighting. This is just a concept sketch where you can see somebody uh, standing at that control panel. And as they go like this, all the buildings change color. Um, interesting concept, <laughs> but um, something like that could be, could be possible. Um, you know, as uh, Malcolm said, I've just come back from New York, so from Hong Kong, so I'm very confused. But um, if anyone's been there uh, and has seen the light show, or if you haven't, go and see the light show. It's quite incredible. You stand in that sort of vista and look at a whole group of buildings across the harbor, and every night they do a light show, so everything is controlled but it's all computer generated, it's all on a pre-program. Um, you can imagine in the future, actually, you could give people the opportunity to interact and do that sort of thing uh, themselves. Uh, this really is one from the gasworks end, but you know, there are some uh, thoughts that maybe trees, you know, um, photoluminescent trees, might in the future be, be providing us some, some outdoor lighting. Um, but that, I think, is certainly way beyond uh, my career in lighting, but I just put it up there as a, as a matter of interest. So I think really, in conclusion, the only question that uh, I've left unanswered is why have we not got any fat stick men? Thanks very much.